Well, that's exciting. <laughs> I officially belong. That's nice. Um, I have good news and bad news for you this morning. Which do you want first? Okay, I'm hearing more to the bad news. So the bad news, at least for some of you, is that what I want to share with you this morning is maybe going to be a little teachy and dense. The good news is that this message is going to be shorter than usual. So hopefully that will balance out the two things. Uh, but even if this train of thought of what I want to share with you might be a little bit harder to follow, I want you to know that we are headed somewhere really practical with this. So hang in there. The journey is going to be worth it. Let's start with a word of prayer and then we'll jump in. Father God, thank you for this church family that has gathered here. Thank you for those who are watching on live stream as well. Um, we want to invite you to clear away the distractions in our mind so that we can be present to what it is you'd want to say to us today. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So there are four accounts of the life of Jesus in your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We call them the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar to each other. And John really stands out in comparison. His book can be very strange. Uh, rather than tell a bunch of stories from the life of Jesus, John is much more interested in recording these long puzzling conversations that Jesus has with other people. And furthermore, the things that Jesus says are often steeped in metaphor rather than in practical applications. Though I have noticed, most people are actually drawn to and prefer this gospel over the other three. So that's interesting. Today we are going to look at one of John's favorite things to talk about. There are two themes that appear all over his writings in the New Testament, both in his gospel account and also in his later epistles. These two themes are the themes of light and love. Light and love. Love is the easiest one to spot. He'll highlight sayings of Jesus that use the word love, and then he'll use the word love again and again on repeat in his later letters in the New Testament. But it's the first theme that we're going to look at today, the theme of light, light. So the idea of light first appears in the opening verses of the book of John. If you want to turn there in your own Bible, John chapter one. If you aren't familiar with the book of John, chapter one has this odd prologue for the rest of the book. It has beautiful poetic prose about Jesus's divine nature and his purpose in the world. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and so on it goes. And after about 10 verses of this, you start to think to yourself, what is going on here? Why is he writing in this way? Well, here's what's cool. In the opening 15 verses or so, John drops breadcrumbs for a number of ideas that he will continue to unpack throughout the rest of the book. So I like to think of this like seeds. Uh, the prologue is planting a number of seeds that will continue to grow and evolve over the course of the book. And what we're going to do is we're just going to watch the seed of light grow throughout John's writings. I'm just going to let John lay out a bunch of ideas for us on the table. I'll comment a bit on how these ideas resurface in his other writings, but I'm just going to set all of the pieces, pieces in front of you to start. And it's going to seem a little scattered and disorganized, but I just want to have everything laid out, and then we'll go back, and we'll start to order our thoughts, and we'll start to put things together. So all that to say, if you start to get a little cross-eyed here at the start, that's okay. Uh, I'll try and help clarify what I think John is getting at by the time we're done. All right, John chapter 1, starting at the very beginning, verse 1. In the beginning, oh, actually, I have this on the screen for you as well. Oh. I'll see if this keeps working. You can go back one slide. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Okay, so what Old Testament book is John referring to here? Genesis, right. So Genesis and John, they both begin with the exact 
three words, in the beginning. John is signaling to us that we are again reading a creation story. And in fact, Jesus' story is going to be a new creation story. So that's just a seed right there. So we have this figure called the Word who was with God and who is God. Now we're going to start talking about light for a while. In him was life, and that life was the what? The light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Is John talking about physical, visible light? No. In fact, he even says point blank what it is that he means by this. In Jesus was life, and that life was the light. For, for who? For all Jews? For all upper class people? For all mankind. So, in fact, there's another seed already. All throughout the gospel, John is going to highlight Jesus sharing the light with surprising people. Jesus doesn't just go hang out in the synagogues and rub shoulders with the religious elite. His light moves towards tax collectors and outcasts and sinners. In fact, only one time in the entire gospel of John does Jesus directly state that he is the Messiah. Do you know who he says that to? Oh, I might have heard it out there. It's the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. So Jesus is the light, and his light shines for all mankind, Pharisees and Samaritan women alike. And then verse 5, this light shines in the darkness. Okay, so let's pause right here. Let's make a, a quick little chart to help ourselves out. So uh, John has already connected light and life together. And if light corresponds to life, then what might darkness correspond to? Yeah, there you go. So death, right? This is going to pop up throughout the gospel as well. Jesus will talk about people who walk in the light versus people who sit in the darkness. There is a way of flourishing and life, and there is a way of death. Now, don't go exchanging these words in and out for each other as you read through the gospel. That's not the point. This is just to help you see what John is getting at thematically here. So track with what John is kind of planting in our minds. In the beginning, the, the very beginning in Genesis, the very first thing that God does is he distinguishes between light and dark. And now Jesus arrives to teach people how to distinguish between light and darkness, between life and death. Then we have the, the last part of the verse here. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We're going to circle back to this later, tuck this away for later. Let's keep reading. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is not the John who wrote this book. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. Uh, if you get a moment later, go to the end of John chapter 20. There's a nice little connection to what's happening here, but we'll move along. He himself, John, was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to who? Everyone. So it doesn't play favorites. It was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So this is the tragedy of the story, isn't it? That the creator God comes as the incarnate Jesus, and his own people don't receive him. All right. We just read a bunch of verses. John gave us a lot to think about and to unpack. So let's start to organize our ideas together. I'm going to divide the rest of our time into four blocks. I want to talk about light, darkness, Jesus, and us. Light, darkness, Jesus, and us. By the end, I think we're going to have a reasonably full picture of what it is that John is trying to get at with the metaphor of light. So, firstly, light. So, Jesus says a couple of different times in this gospel, I am the light of the world. And remember our chart, what John connects this to, 
Light corresponds to life. In Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Now, this is a common Christian idea. Many of you have heard this dozens, if not hundreds of times, that Jesus is the source of all life and truth. Come to him if you want to have life. Just consider the most famous verse in all of Scripture, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that we might have what? Eternal life. Now, let's be clear on what this actually means. This is crucial to understand. When we think of eternal life, we often think of life forever in heaven with God, or more correctly, life forever in the new earth with God. But the Bible presents eternal life as something more than just some future condition where we never die. Eternal life is, in fact, only once clearly defined in the entire Bible, and it's Jesus himself who says these words. This is John chapter 17. Now this is eternal life. Okay, get ready. This is eternal life that they what? Know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What does Jesus say is eternal life? Knowing God. This has been a total paradigm shift for me. So here's a picture to help illustrate what I think is going on here. Many Christians think of eternal life as something that begins after the grave. Something that starts after the return of Jesus. But Jesus introduces a reality where eternal life can begin here and now and then carry on into the eternal reign and rule of Jesus when he returns. How can this be? It's because, don't miss this, it's because eternal life is primarily qualitative, not quantitative. Eternal life is knowing God. It's living in and with his presence. And because of Jesus and because of the gift of the Spirit, we have the ability to begin to experience that here and now. Now, this concept could be its own full Bible study. Here's all that I want you to catch for the purpose of what we're talking about right now. The light of Jesus is not just some intellectual truth to grasp. It is a reality that you are invited to step into and experience. Because Jesus came, we can all experience the joy of eternal life, knowledge of and relationship with God, here right now. Some of God's promised tomorrow can come to life right now, here today. So, all that to say, when Jesus announces I am the light of the world, it means much more than just I am the source of all intellectual and theological truth. He's saying that he is offering a different way of living and experiencing life. All right, moving on, let's talk about darkness. John says that this light shines in the darkness. I was reading something about uh, Shackleton's Antarctic expedition in the early 1900s. Do you remember this story? Yeah, so there's this captain named Shackleton, and he and his crew of men are trying to walk across Antarctica. Uh, But their ship gets stuck in the ice and gets crushed. Uh, What did they think would happen? Uh, And uh, then their expedition just turns into this uh, survival story that lasts for months. Well, anyway, the thing that I was reading about this said that of all of the difficulties that they faced, starvation, freezing temperatures, the worst thing of all was the darkness. So near the South Pole, where they were, the sun will go down in mid-May, and it doesn't come back up until late July. So for more than two months, there's no daylight, there's no sun. And for Shackleton's crew, this experience was maddening. They they couldn't see forward. They couldn't see those around them. There was no sense of direction. Turns out, it's not just physical darkness that brings disorientation. Spiritual darkness does the same. The Bible says that spiritual darkness is when we disorient 
from God as our true center in life. So, so the contrast that John is making here is that God is the source of all life and truth. He is light. And if you orbit your life around him, then your life finds true meaning and purpose. And to live centered around anything else, no matter how fulfilling that might appear, that is to live in disorientation. It's to live in darkness. And Jesus comes to rescue us from this. Listen to Jesus' own words. Oh, my finger was covering it. Ah, you can go back one slide. Uh, No, that's actually the right slide. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. I'm going to read that again. Jesus says, I've come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness, disorientation, death. Now, that sounds nice. But how does Jesus do this? How can Jesus free people from darkness so that they can live in the light? Well, this is the beautiful reversal of the cross. Jesus, who is by nature light and life, absorbs all of our darkness and death at the cross. His sacrifice paves a way for us to be able to experience true light and life in the presence of God. So this is going to bring us back to that phrase that I said that we were going to come back to. This is John 1 verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now that's the NIV. Some of you might have a Bible that says the darkness did not comprehend it. Uh, The word that John picked there is ambiguous. It can mean both things. It could mean to overcome or to overpower, but it can also mean to understand or to comprehend. A a helpful English equivalent for this is our word master. So if you master something, that could mean that you overpowered it, but it can also mean that you figured it out and now you understand it. So John is saying the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not master it. But which meaning between the two does he mean? Well, I think it's both. I think it's kind of meant as a double entendre here. So Jesus enters a world of darkness and disorientation, and when he shows up and reveals the light, the world doesn't really understand it. Jesus' ethical system and the way that he comes to reign as a suffering servant, it feels so upside down that people just don't get it. But think also to our chart. If life corresponds, light corresponds to life, then darkness also corresponds to death. Not only could this disoriented world of darkness not understand Jesus and his mission, but death also couldn't overpower him. Jesus comes to rule and to bring a new way of life, and the former rule of death cannot overcome this. And that is some of the best news in the gospel. So we've talked about light. We've talked about darkness. Now I want to talk about Jesus. I want to share about the kind of light that Jesus brings to the world. And to do this, we need to talk about light bulbs. So I brought props with me. This is unusual. So there are two basic kinds of light bulbs in the world. There are fluorescent and there are incandescent light bulbs. There's also LEDs, which are more popular than ever, but it ruins my illustration, so forget about those. So there's only fluorescent and incandescent light bulbs in our world. Uh, Both produce light, but they do so in very different ways. Uh, I I read about this all on uh, Wikipedia this week, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, Let's start with incandescent light bulbs. So uh, incandescent light bulbs work when electricity heats up a filament inside of the bulb, and eventually that filament gets so hot that it emits light. Simple enough. I even understand that one. (laughs) <laughs> fluorescent light bulbs, a lot more complicated. So um, y- you'll notice if you look at a fluorescent light bulb, 
they're always in tubes of some kind. So either they're long and straight, or like this one, they've got a, a kind of a tubed connection, or they'll spiral around from one end to the other. Uh, that's because there needs to be two ends, so to speak, in a fluorescent bulb. This bulb is actually full of gas. And when electricity comes into the bulb, all of the electrons in the bulb start running around and colliding with new gases that are being released. And eventually, this causes them to get so energized that they start to give off light. Now, this light is actually not visible to our human eye, which is why fluorescent light bulbs always have that white coating inside. It's a special chemical coating that turns the invisible light visible. Super nerdy, blew my mind just reading about this. So here's the point that I want you to, to catch. There's one really key difference between these two kinds of bulbs. Incandescent light bulbs emit light and heat. That's how they function. Fluorescent light bulbs only emit light and a little bit of heat. So they're more energy efficient because of this. So fluorescent light bulbs give off light. Incandescent light bulbs give off light and warmth. When Jesus comes into a world of darkness, he comes as an incandescent light. There we go. He comes with light and warmth. Or to use the language of John, he comes with grace and truth. He comes to present the will of the Father, but also to present the love of the Father. And this is how Jesus changed the course of history. Not by just telling everyone everything that was true and right and then flying away. Jesus changed the world by getting his hands dirty to show the height and the depth and the breadth of God's love. It was by washing feet and standing up for the vulnerable, and ultimately by dying as an innocent man. Jesus comes as the light to warm our cold, darkened, disoriented hearts back toward the love of God. Now this brings us, finally, to us. To us. So as we've talked about in the past few weeks, Jesus' mission extends to us. Jesus doesn't just give off light and warmth so that Christians today can read about it and experience it for ourselves. No, we are to become beacons of that same light to our world today. You remember um, Jesus's famous, I am the light of the world statement? Do you know what comes right after he says this? So this is John chapter 8. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, when we follow Jesus, we aren't just hanging out in the light. The light of Jesus fills us from the inside out so that we can reflect it to others. Jesus states this same idea again a little bit later. This is John chapter 12, believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become what? I'll try this again. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become what? <laughs> children of light. What is Jesus saying? What does it mean to be children of life? It means that the same grace and truth that we see in Jesus is something that ought to flourish in our own lives. John might be communicating in really dense metaphors, but what he's talking about is incredibly practical. You've probably seen this vertical horizontal thing before, where our, the vertical axis is our relationship with God. The horizontal axis is our relationship with other people. And there in the middle, our Christian call is to show love both directions. So this is how Jesus summarized the law, right? Love for God, love for for others. This is what it means to have light, and this is what it means to have life. I don't know if you ever have problems with autocorrect on your phone, changing what you say into something else. The latest problem that I'm having is that it always turns well into the contraction wheel. 
very frustrating. Anyways, that's not why I brought this up. So I used to have this problem where every time I typed the word love, it would autocorrect to live. Yes, very frustrating. But you know, that autocorrect is a nice little taste of John's theology. Light corresponds to life. Life corresponds to love. To truly love is to truly live. In fact, I'll let John say it himself. This is something that he writes later in the New Testament. We know that we have passed from death to life because we what? Love each other. Anyone who does not love remains where? In death. So fully loving and fully living are synonymous. And it is this kind of life that Jesus invites us into. Love for God and love for others. Let me up the ante for you a little bit, though. So this is where the real challenge comes, isn't it? A Christian is called to take whatever relational love and life that they receive from their walk with God, and then they are to extend that to both their allies and their enemies. This is what Jesus did. This is what we are to do. John writes this later in his letter to the church. Anyone who claims to be in the light, but who still hates a brother or sister, is still where? In the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. There's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They don't know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. So do you see how this is all connected? Jesus' light is the knowledge and experience of God's love, and we are called to share that same love with everyone around us. So here is the really practical thing that I want to leave you with today. We are called to be incandescent lights for God. We are to give off light and warmth, truth, and grace. Jesus could have come, and he could have just preached for three years, shared with everyone all that there was to know about God, and tell them the list of things that you need to believe in order to be saved, but he didn't do that. He welcomed outsiders. He healed people. He stood up for the vulnerable He even challenged the very people who thought that they had all the truth. In him was life, and that life was incandescent light for all mankind. You know, I have been an Adventist my whole life. I've grown up in Adventist churches and schools and communities. And at this point, I've heard enough stories And I've seen enough people leave to recognize that our churches and our leaders and our members have a real tendency to be fluorescent lights for God. Bright, vivid, crystal clear truth, little to no warmth. Don't mishear me. Truth is good. Jesus was full of truth, but his warmth is what drew people in so that they were willing to hear it. Church family, what is the point of a beautiful Adventist message that we just keep preaching to ourselves? Our mission statement, again, is revealing the loving character of God. Do you know what reveals the loving character of God? Light. Truth about who God is and what he has done and the life that he is calling us into. Do you know what also reveals the loving character of God? Warmth. When we have open arms and forgiving hearts and we have gentle spirits. I want to invite the, some of the praise team back up. Uh, we're going to close with a song that I went back and forth on this week because I was convinced it was way too corny to do 
but we're going to do it anyways, and it still might be corny. That's fine. <laughs> uh, we're going to sing together this little line of mine. Uh, don't laugh. This is a serious moment. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to invite you to stand, actually, as we sing this. So when, when kids sing this song, what kind of light do they imagine that they're holding? It's a candle, right? So don't let Satan blow it out. So candle, that's an incandescent light for sure. Now, compared to Jesus, our little light may not give off a lot of light. It may not give off a lot of heat. But church family, if we were to come together, I told you this is going to be so corny. If we were to come together, our little lights just might make the Skagit Valley a warmer and brighter place. So sing with me. I don't know if the words, I don't think the words are going to be on the screen, but we'll do this little light of mine. Won't let Satan blow it out. We won't blow just so that we don't blow, but we'll say blow it out and then let it shine till Jesus comes all around the neighborhood. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out, I'm going to let it shine. You know, Rachel and I had debates this week because there's like three legitimate ways to sing this song. And I warned her, I was like, no, they know it where they only sing it twice and then they go to the end. So uh, I was right. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for being with us this Sabbath. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the light that you have shared with this world, the light that transforms us and gives us eternal life the ability to live in and with your presence. May we be beacons of that same light and warmth to those that we come in contact with in this coming week. We love you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.